Thank you. Today we ask, who to obey? The law or the prophets? The question answers itself in the Bible where Moses declares, if only all the people of the Lord were prophets, if only the Lord would bestow his spirit on them. I like to think of Catherine of Siena as one of the prophets. Catherine, in whose memory this annual lecture is named, had no problem speaking, as the phrase goes, truth to power. She was a 14th century Third Order Dominican, a member of a group of women who ministered to the poor and the needy in her hometown of Siena, Italy. Catherine wrote more than 400 letters and made no secret of her disgust at some of the clerical excesses and abuses of power she saw around her. She's credited with getting Pope Gregory XI to leave the south of France and go back to work in Rome. What she wrote and what she did caused her, with St. Teresa of Avila, to be named one of two women doctors of the church in 1970. And then in 1999, Catherine was named patron of Europe. The Middle Ages presented the same types of problems the church faces today. In Catherine's day, the corruption in the church gave rise to reformers such as John Wycliffe and Jan Hus, along with several sects the church called heretical. The Black Death, the bubonic plague, that ravaged Europe, ravaged the power of the clergy who could not stop its spread and who too often worked more for themselves than for the people. They preached, but what did they preach and to whom? Like the people of the church today, the people of medieval Europe were faced with the same question. Who, or if we want to be formal, whom to obey? Should they obey the law? Or should they listen to the prophets? And which law? Which prophets? Now, as then, the law and the prophets seem to be in constant collision. Today's church needs updating. Today's church needs to pay attention to the needs of the people. Today's church does not seem to be working very well. We all know that. Fracture and factions, infighting and insults abound. The whole church, the people of God, must figure out how to go forward as one. That's called synodality. What is synodality? Well, it's the way the church, the whole church, once made decisions. And it's the way Pope Francis wants to make decisions again. Synodality involves prayerful discernment, not parliamentary procedure, in to resolve the questions before the church. True synodality could quell the tension between the law and the prophets. But then what? Well, let's start with synodality. It, it's an interesting word. What, what it means, or at least what it connotes is mutual discernment, collaborative discussion, and reflection on the topic at hand. The process is so distinctive that Pope Francis has made it the topic of the next meeting of the Synod of Bishops in Rome in October 2022. Now, what's a Synod of Bishops? Well, it's not exactly a standing body. In September 1965, at the start of the fourth meeting of the Second Vatican Council, Pope Paul VI announced the formation of the Synod of Bishops, an advisory body of bishops to discuss topics of deep interest, even of pressing concern to the church as a whole. Since then, various synods have met in Rome to discuss a number of topics. Just, just before Francis became Pope, the 13th Ordinary General Assembly of the Synod of Bishops studied the new evangelization and the Christian faith. Pope Francis called an extraordinary general assembly of the Synod of Bishops in 2014 on the family, and then two ordinary general assemblies, on one on the family in 2015, and another on young people in 2018. Now, shortly before the 2018 general assembly, Pope Francis promulgated an apostolic constitution called Episcopalis Communius, Communio in the Synod of Bishops, a, a solemn magisterial act changing the norms for calling and conducting synods. Now, now, just so you know, 
there are only two higher type documents, a papal bull and an encyclical. A papal bull is an official uh, declaration or announcement, and an encyclical addresses church doctrine. So Episcopalis Communio, uh, what he wrote, recalls that the Synod of Bishops was created as an instrument of shared knowledge among the bishops, who would meet with common prayer and common and honest exchange for a deepening of Christian doctrine, a reform of ecclesiastical structures, and promotion of pastoral activity throughout the world. Now, in that apostolic constitution, Francis goes a little further. He writes, the bishop is both teacher and disciple. He's a teacher when endowed with the special assistance of the Holy Spirit, he proclaims to the faithful the word of truth in the name of Christ, head and shepherd. But he is a disciple when, knowing that the Spirit has been bestowed upon every baptized person, he listens to the voice of Christ speaking through the entire people of God, making it, quote, infallible in credendo, or in believing. The term in credendo refers to the statement in Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution of the Church of the Second Vatican Council, that the entire body of the faithful, anointed as they are by the Holy One, cannot err in matters of belief. So, the Synod of Bishops would do just fine if the bishops attending were in tune with their flocks. No one can disagree with that. But what about the entire body of the faithful? The question arises, why not have other members of the church at the synod? Could the people of God be better served if their voices were heard at the assemblies of the synod of bishops? Could the whole church be better served? Could the resulting final document of the synod genuinely be infallible in credendo if laity could have input? Would the result be more in keeping with the developing doctrine of the church if everyone in attendance, not just the bishops, had a vote? Now, the most recent synod was the 2019 Special Assembly of the Synod of Bishops for the Pan-Amazon region, and it asked for some interesting changes in the church. At least it asked for changes in and among the countries and territories of South America, bordering the Amazon region, the, you know, Brazil, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, Peru, Suriname, Venezuela, and the territory of French Guyana. Among other things, the Amazon Synod asked for a limited married priesthood, the installation of women as lectors and acolytes, and for continued consideration of the restoration of women to the ordained diaconate. You may recall the other concerns and questions and requests raised during the 2019 Amazon Synod. Pope Francis named some 185 voting members to the Synod, all bishops, and some 100 non-voting experts. Many of the non-voting experts were female. None had a vote. And that created a lot of commentary. And there's, a, there's an interesting wrinkle to the vote-no-vote no vote controversy. Two groups, the Union of Superiors General, called USG, and the International Union of Superiors General, called UISG, represent the majority of the major superiors of the world's religious institutes and orders. The men's group, the USG, named 15 members and each had a vote. The women's group named 10 sisters, but none had a vote. Why? Well, there is the argument that the men's superiors are the equivalent to bishops. Equally, women major superiors might be considered the equivalent of the medieval abbesses, many who were ordained as deacons, but who had jurisdiction in the past over large territories and who actually granted priestly faculties within them. Now, most of the voting USG members were priests, but two brothers among the 15 male superiors are laymen. That is, they're not ordained priests, but they were major superiors. Now, none of the women named by their group, the UISG, was a major superior. So were the women denied votes based on their lay status or because they were not general superiors or only because they were women? 
or all three. <laughs> See, now the Code of Canon Law describes the Synod of Bishops as a group of bishops who have been chosen from different regions of the world and meet together at fixed times to foster closer unity between the Roman pontiff and the bishops, to assist the Roman pontiff with their counsel in the preservation and growth of faith and morals, in the observance and strengthening of ecclesiastical discipline, and to consider questions pertaining to the activity of the church and the world. Pope Francis's apostolic constitution adds, Besides the members, that is the bishops, certain invited guests without voting rights may attend the Senate Assembly. These include experts who help with the redaction of the documents, auditors who have particular competence regarding the issues under discussion, fraternal delegates from churches and ecclesial communities not yet in full communion with the Catholic Church, and to these may be added further special guests chosen because of their acknowledged authority. The bottom line, USG men were members of the Amazon Synod. The UISG women were auditors. Two lay USG members did get votes, but as with the rest of the church events, it seems the only opinions that counted were those of the clerics. That's certainly borne out in church law. To be sure, as it developed, canon law continually erected and even today maintains a large fence, keeping laymen and women away from policy and sacrament. You see, the tension in today's church is not a new tension, but it's a tension now voiced by academics in professional journals and by general public in social media. Now, are some of these writers, the professionals and the amateurs, prophets? Do they or any one of them proclaim the will of God? There's a lot of chatter, but who's listening? If we think of the whole church, including the people of God, who, who does the church pay attention to? Who do the members of the Synod of Bishops pay attention to? Who does the Pope pay attention to? Who depends on law? And who depends on prophets? You see, we have to recognize that the Catholic Church is ruled by law. In fact, the Catholic Church has the oldest continual legal system in the world. Canon law historians speak about the ancient law, the law of the ancient church, the new law, the law from the 12th to the 16th century, the newest law, which would be the law of the 16th century going forward, and now the law of the code, which is the 1917 code of canon law, which was compiled at the request of the First Vatican Council. Now today, however, the church is governed by another new code of canon law, this one promulgated in 1983 after several years of meetings and consultations with canonists and theologians and bishops. Many sections in the 1983 code write the laity out of the church. The bedrock of clerical control is canon 129, paragraph two. When that canon was being debated, there were two schools of thought the so-called German school, and the Roman school. Now, the Roman school wanted the canons to say lay persons could share in the exercise of power. And the German school wanted the canon to say that lay persons could cooperate in the exercise of power. And the German school won the vote, 52 votes to exclude lay persons from the exercise of power and therefore from obtaining any jurisdiction. And the concept of including laity and governance and jurisdiction received nine votes. So, Canon 129, paragraph two, which regulates, quote, the power of governance, also called the power of jurisdiction, reads, lay members of the Christian faithful can cooperate in the exercise of the same power as the power of governance, according to the norm of law. The canon was written by then Archbishop Joseph Ratzinger. The point is, there's no workaround to Canon 129, Paragraph 2. The law is the law, and the law dictates that laity are permitted to cooperate, not share, in governance and jurisdiction. Now, th there are two responses to this barrier, this, this clerical fence 
erected around the powers of governance and jurisdiction. One is to walk away. The other is to stay and complain. I think we see a lot of people walking away from the church for many different reasons. On the right, we have individuals, their ire fueled by blogs and news media proclaiming their, quote, authentic beliefs. For example, LifeSite News, Eternal Word, World, Word Television Network, the EWTN, The Wanderer, and a few others. On the left, news media and publications of various organizations fuel the fury against the right. Catholics for Choice, New Ways Ministry, and the National Catholic Reporter come to mind. In the middle, but still leaning one way or the other, are older publications like American Commonweal and their attendant blogs and podcasts. The issues these all discuss include many having to do with sex and marriage, divorce and remarriage, contraception, homosexual relationships come to mind, and each outlet falls on one side or the other. Then there's the problem of abortion. Even within the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, there's dissent from the conference's 2020 pre-election statement that abortion is a preeminent priority. One side that, of the discussion fuels argument over whether the current president of the United States, who happens to be Roman Catholic, can receive communion in a Catholic church. Without parsing the argument, let me just say that accepting the law of the land does not constitute moral cooperation with abortion. I'm not happy with President Biden's stance on the Hyde Amendment, which restricts federal expenditures on abortion and forbids abortions in most federal faculties, facilities. But I'm not his pastor, and I'm not his bishop. They are the ones who discuss the matter with the president privately. Publicly, I think the proper response for all Catholics is to voice their opinions in the proper fora. There is, this is, that is, objection to federal expenditures for abortion, expenditures of America's tax dollars for abortion, is something that should be made known to legislators at every level. You know the field, and you know the issues, which in large part have created political discussion over moral questions. But Getting back to the exercise of power as far as participation in governance and jurisdiction within the church is concerned, the law says laity cannot exercise government and jurisdiction. So, we're prophets. As you must know, it is the right and the duty of the laity to make their needs known to the hierarchy. Depending on how you look at it and on your own experience, such as either an exciting possibility or a lost cause. We've all suffered the imperious pastor who listens to no one, especially women, and whose only path is his own. I recall here the pastor who refused to meet with the older women in the parish. He said, don't waste my time with old women, even though they were the backbone of ministry to the homebound. Then there's the pastor who smiles through pastoral council meetings and goes on with his own agenda. The list go on and on. And the bishops who ignore the laity are legion. In large part, the people of God have to depend on the prophets, the inspired speakers or writers rooted in the word of God who address the situation, whatever it is, directly and forcefully. But there are many false prophets and more than enough to confuse things. The things prophets speak about are both internal and external to church matters and affairs. Like the political discussion on abortion, another example of an external matter would be Spain's recent legalization of euthanasia and assisted suicide. In Spain today, anyone over the age of 18 may choose to end his or her life after claiming intolerable pain, despite the advances of palliative care. Currently, euthanasia is legal in many other developed countries, including Belgium, Canada, Colombia, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Western Australia. To these, we might add the countries with legalized abortion or that allow transgender surgery for minor children. The prophet might say, the life you save may be your own. External matters include the environment, 
Pope Francis's masterful 2015 encyclical letter, Laudato Si, on the care of our common home, has yet to be fully received. And the horrific worldwide tragedies of migrants, especially now as we endure a pandemic or of exponential proportions, must be addressed. Prophetic voices raise these concerns and will continue to raise these concerns as the earth and its people continue to suffer. Internal church matters are also subject to prophetic voices. The place of women in the church echoes the maltreatment of women in too many societies. Think of the women forced into menstruation huts in Nepal, the women subject to dowry burning or kitchen fire deaths in India, or the women now sterile because of childhood female genital mutilation in any one of a number of African or Eastern countries. None of them can look to St. Peter's Basilica and see a woman proclaiming the gospel there. Neither can the women in Australia, in the United States, or the United Kingdom, or any South American or European Union nation easily find a trained woman minister supported, and by that I mean paid, by the parish or diocese. More than once, Pope Francis has called for a more incisive presence of women in the church. But aside from a few appointments within Va the Vatican and a few diocesan chancellors here or there, what change do women see? Are women allowed to preach, allowed to speak in church, or in the church at large? The interesting point is that there's no legal way for a trained woman to preach during the Mass about the pressing concerns external or internal to the church. So, online preaching for have sprung up. Catholic women preach and Australian women preach will surely be joined by women preachers in other lands and languages as women are continually fenced off from diaconal altar service. The ordained deacon, as you know, is permitted to preach the homily in a mass, and he, and sometimes, hopefully she, participates in. Today, the only way a woman can leg legally preach at mass is at a mass for children. Now, beyond preaching, how does a woman gain access? How does a woman gain a hearing when she wants to fulfill her right and duty, as canon law rules, to make known to the pastors of the church their needs, especially the spiritual ones and their desires. I think at least part of the answer depends on a given culture, and unfortunately on the culture of clericalism that infects every level, level of the clergy. Recall the problems Dorothy Day had within the Archdiocese of New York over her use of the term the Catholic worker, not to mention over some of her comments about poverty, hunger, and war. The place of women in the church is an ongoing discussion fraught with anger and misinformation. In my own diocese, the, di the director of deacon personnel has, has falsely stated that Pope Francis does not want the question of women deacons discussed at all. Now, if clericalism is the fence, how can the people get prophetic messages across? How can the people of God leverage the message of prophets to get the hierarchy to pay attention and to act? Please don't say TikTok. I, I think the answer, the answer to the tension between the law as it has constrained the church and the over-anxious prophets who perhaps want to throw the law into the Tiber is discernment. Consider, if you will, the possibility that the law is the guardrail keeping the prophets from crashing over the cliff, or that the law is the training wheels keeping the prophets on the straight and narrow. There are many so-called false prophets, only too happy to take up your time, but there are true prophets, ones whose words may challenge structure or tradition, ones to seek, who want to seek to build up rather than to tear down. And they're all around it. They're all around us. The problem is to seek out those who use the law as a guide and not as a baseball bat. That is where the entire church is called to discern, to discern what is possible, to discern between the good and the bad, 
and the process, whether individually or as part of a group, re remember synodality, the process requires facts and understanding of the questions the prophets may be presenting, along with the facts and understandings of the law. So, what is discernment? It's clearly a term taken from the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus, of the Jesuits. In his exercises, Ignatius presents a methodology for careful discernment. The process is delicate, but not that complex. Part of Ignatius' teaching involves the good angel and the evil spirit, each of whom is capable of exciting the soul to acceptance of an idea or a way of proceeding. It is a mark of the evil spirit to give the appearance of the good angel. But Ignatius warns, if a good person carefully follows the logic, the train of thought, if you will, of the evil spirit, the result is desolation. When I lecture on spirituality, I tell students that the telling point of failed ideas presented by the evil spirit is, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Now, good people, can discern bad ideas quickly. Ignatius says bad ideas are violent, noisy, and disturbing like a drop of water falling on a stone. Likewise, good people can immediately recognize the suggestions of the goody, good angel, whose action is delicate, gentle, and delightful, as Ignatius says, like a drop of water penetrating a sponge. Now, discernment, a wise bishop once wrote to me, is not an organizational technique and not even a passing fashion, but it is an interior action and attitude rooted in an act of faith. Discernment is the method and at the same time the goal. It is based on the belief that God is at work in the history of the world, in the events of life, in the people we meet and speak to us. That is why we're called to listen to what the Spirit suggests to us in often unpredictable ways and directions. Now, the point is discernment. The question is, who to obey? Who to listen to? See, the idea is to head in the right direction, to take advice and to sift through the facts and make a decision, yet a cacophony of words and sounds and pictures floods our space, our minds, and our lives. Despite the restrictions of COVID, despite the isolation, there's a little silence in our lives unless we take the chance to embrace it. Then we can, with quite care, quiet and careful meditation, discern the answer to whatever question presents itself. The tension between the law and the prophets will always be there. The wish of both the Bible and the church that all God's people be prophets is real and workable, only if the speech is informed and the writing is respectful. We all know enough not to get involved with physical violence, but there's a genuine violence taking place every day on the internet, in chat rooms, in all manner of social media. For example, terms like the China virus appear on blogs <clears throat> written by Catholic priests. One disgraced priest even blogged online exorcisms, not only against the current pandemic, which he renamed <coughs> the Wuhan devil, but against the so-called stolen US presidential elections. He seems to have stopped, but his number is legion. How has the social media fomented the Capitol riots and anti-Asian violence? How has the strident, angry denigration of Pope Francis emanating from the alt-right fed the undercurrent of law-wielding clerics, metaphorically wearing Benedict is my Pope t-shirts under their 33-button Roman cassocks? How has the frothy anything-goes commentary recently and always attacking restatements of Catholic doctrine created a segment of the church that is, in and of itself, schismatic? I think here of breakaway movements like the Roman Catholic women priests, the current century's mirror to the Protestant Reformation. What to do? Should we listen to the preacher who is concentrated on the negative? Don't do this, don't do that. 
or should we pay more attention when the preaching skirts the law? Well, this, this is okay under these circumstances because we need to be kind and accept everyone's opinion. Which is the voice of the Spirit? Earlier, I mentioned the book of Numbers. In it, the people are angry. They're distraught because they're in a foreign land with no comfort and little to eat besides unappealing manna. They remember the earlier times when they had fish in Egypt and cucumbers and melons and leeks and onions and garlic. They had God's promise in their wandering, but they did not have meat. Why, they asked, why did they ever leave Egypt? To find an answer to their plight, Moses gathered 70 elders, but even among them, there was no prophecy, no answer. Then the Bible tells us the spirit came to rest on two men, Eldad and Medad, who were not part of the original gathering. Someone complained these two were prophesying and Moses declared, if only all the people of the Lord were prophets, if only the Lord would bestow his spirit on them. Like the people in the book of Numbers, the people of the church today are wanderers. There are other prophets, but perhaps Catherine of Siena can point the way. Catherine, you'll recall, spent no time on false prophets, on the voices that drew people away from the project of synodality and who either ignored or abused the law. Catherine also knew she had to speak. She had to speak against the abuses of her day, no matter that more than once she was called to silence. Her answer was simple. We've had enough exhortations to be silent, she said. Cry out with a thousand tongues. The world is rotten because of silence. Now her question was, who to obey, the law or the prophets? The, the problem is discerning which position is guided by the spirit. That's not easy. No one ever said it would be. Thank you.